Hi, thank you for the introduction, Liz, and thank you for hanging on, guys. I know we've got a little bit of kinks to work out this morning, but we're here for you, and we're going to make sure that we have a great summit. Um, we wanted to invite the new director of Metro Health, Dr. John Emmerich, to join us this morning, but she's dedicating her time to address the COVID concerns. But we're happy to welcome Dr. Carlos Rodriguez, the Health Equity Manager at Metro Health, to give us some updates about COVID in Bayer County. And I want to remind you guys in the audience that you can ask questions and use the chat function. Uh, the moderators will be um, answering questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Do you want me to start? Yes, Carlos, you're live, go. Thank you, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I just wanna make a clarification. I am not a doctor and I don't think I look like a doctor. Uh, so, uh, however, just a clarification. Um, and uh, uh, again, good morning and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm glad I can uh, talk to uh, community health workers and people working in the community that do a very, very valuable work, particularly at this time uh, when we're facing this uh, COVID-19. I have some uh, updated information that I, I hope it can be useful for, for all the audience. So uh, I'm gonna start with the current situation uh, and the public health response, particularly when it comes to uh, Metro Health. So uh, right now, this is the current situation in our country. And these numbers are good as, as of uh, the end of yesterday. So, uh, as of the end of yesterday, we had 374,329 uh, confirmed cases in our country. Uh, 1,669 uh, uh, were travel-related infections, and uh, 6,847 were close contact infections. And uh, 360,813 under investigation. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, so yesterday we had 12 and 64 deaths. That's in the country. Talking about our community, these are the numbers of the end of yesterday in Bear County. We have three in case 24.7 of those are infections related to travel. 35.6% um, were infected due to close contact, and 9.8 percent were infections of the community. 50, which is 9.9 percent, are under litigation. Also, fortunately, yesterday 18 deaths. Now, there's one thing that I want to point out here, which is percentage of community spread cases. So at this point, the community spread cases are already um, a bigger and uh, or larger than the, the travel cases. So it means that we have spread already in our community, and it's important to have, have that into consideration. Discuss that a little later. Why? So it is important just to explain how COVID nineteen spread is pretty much a due to droplets produced uh, when we call for needs. It also uh, it goes to personal contact, such as caring of, of, of an infected person already that is uh, sick uh, from COVID-19. Also touching the object or surfaces with the virus. So, and then uh, touching our mouth, our nose, or eyes before washing our hands. Those are the most common ways of uh, transmit the virus. So, it is important that we focus on prevention. And I think all the messages have been, you know, uh, related to that uh, lately and actually since the beginning, because it's important for um, all of us to watch, to wash our hands uh, with soap and water. Uh, for at least 20 seconds, and the uh, soap and water are very effective 
to uh, you know uh, eliminate the the virus, and the virus doesn't go, uh, can you know get into uh, you know our respiratory system. However, it's also recommended when we have uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer to use it. Now, obviously, these days it's difficult to find those sometimes. So soap and water uh, are very effective as well. So we encourage everybody to do it uh, as often as possible. Uh, also to uh, reduce risk, it's important to avoid touching our eyes, our nose and mouth. We don't wash hands, just like I said earlier. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, it is important to cover our cough and, and sneeze with a tissue. Uh, so, so that way, you know, we prevent to give it to somebody else. Uh, it's also very important to avoid close contact with people who are sick, and that's why that's why it's very important to be careful when we uh, uh, need to uh, isolate ourselves if we get infected. It is very important to clean and disinfect uh, the, you know, the the frequent touch objects or surfaces. So, you know, we prevent to pass the virus to somebody else. You know, it, obviously, in general, everybody's at risk, but there's a population that is a higher risk. And based on our experience, the, the uh, older adults, uh, uh, particularly the ones that live in nursing homes and long-term long care facilities, are a very high risk. It is pretty much a result of, you know, um, all their you know, health conditions that they already have, such as uh, lung disease, whether it is severe or whether it's moderate, uh, also uh, serious heart conditions or any condition that you know, is the immune system that includes, for instance, individuals that are having therapy cancer and, uh, and other, other diseases that uh, diminish the uh, immune system. Obesity is also uh, uh, really good that some things affect people uh, and put them at high risk. Uh, diabetes, obviously, or also when we have uh, renal, renal failure or uh, liver disease. Those are some, some of the conditions that uh, put uh, our population uh, at high risk. Uh, so that is very important, again, to focus on prevention of the population at risk. That's what is very important for uh, our elderly people it's, it's important for everybody but it's more significant for the other people to stay home uh, wash their hands and utilize a hand sanitizer and keep the six feet of distance from other people and particularly if somebody is sick to utilize the mask you know just to avoid uh, uh, the person to uh, give the virus to somebody else Obviously, if there are symptoms that indicate that uh, a condition is getting worse, such as difficult breathing or persistent pain or pressure in the chest or confusion and things like that, it's very important to call the doctor first and follow the doctor's order. Uh, now, we have learned that uh, uh, these are the most common symptoms from COVID-19. Fever is one of them, cough and shortness of breath. Those are the three major uh, symptoms that we have observed, but other uh, individuals have reported additional ones. That includes muscle aches and fatigue, that includes severe illness. And it's important to know that when somebody's infected, the, the symptoms may appear uh, between the second and the 14 days after the exposure. Now, it currently, uh, uh, Metro Health has a screening tool for individuals to use. That is available on our website. And also, if you go to the City of San Antonio website, you will find also a link to get connected to San Antonio Metro Health District. And uh, you can find the self-screening uh, self tool in which pretty much anybody can go through that answer the questions and, and pretty much determine if the person uh, is meeting the criteria for getting tested. I explained more on the testing uh, protocol a little, a little bit later. 
So in, in terms of the current situation and uh, our public health response, uh, I'm showing this graph, which is maybe a, a, a lot of you guys have already seen it, but it's uh, a, the, the flatten the curve graph is very important for us to, to understand because the, the main point here is that every community needs to focus on diminish or eliminate as much as possible the spread of the virus and uh, try to avoid to have uncontrolled transmission of the COVID-19. Why? Because if we don't do that, then we're going to overwhelm our uh, healthcare system and our hospitals and our healthcare workers, and uh, uh, and then that that will be catastrophic. That's why it's very important for the community to follow all the directives from uh, doctors and infectious disease specialists and uh, anybody that is dating, except for in every single city. So that way we do not have infections out of control, you know, that again, are going to overwhelm our system. Uh, as everybody maybe also know, uh, the our mayor and our county judge uh, put some orders that we call it stay home and war safe uh, is some, some days ago. And actually uh, it became effective on March 23rd at 11.59 uh, p.m. So the stay home and war safe uh, directives and orders is a collaboration between the city and county officials. Um, again, uh, it is very important. This is a very important strategy to flatten the curve, again, to have the infections under control to prevent the healthcare system to be uh, overwhelmed, you know, and uh, it is important for all of us, all the residents to follow these guidelines. Um, and uh, one of the important things about uh, is staying home is, is, again, just not to put ourselves at risk and if anybody uh, is already infected, de decrease or eliminate the risk to transmit it to somebody else. Also, social distancing uh, has been put in place at uh, uh, you know some of the uh, aspects in the in the orders, you know, and also implemented at the workplace with the main purpose of staying safe uh, for uh, anybody that needs to work. Uh, uh, and I know that some of us are working from home, but not, not everybody is. So if, if you still need to go out and uh, perform certain important duties. Uh, it's important that you maintain also the social distancing of the six feet from other individuals. So also one of the goals of these orders is to limit uh, to the minimum the movement just to the essential trips. Now, it's important to understand what essential means. So in this case, we're talking about business and organization that are providing products or services that are needed for the community during this crisis. This is a short list of some of the organizations that are considered doing essential work. Healthcare operations, obviously, because this is part also of the response and also taking care of the sick patients or the people that are infected critical government functions and services, public transportation, shelter services, constructions, utilities, utilities and information technology that is obviously very important for our community and our city and our um, businesses and hospitals to operate. Financial institutions and grocery, uh, grocery stores. Those are, uh, this is a short list of some of the organizations that are considered essential for, for functioning. There are some activities that are allowed under the, the current orders. Uh, and this, uh, I'm just pointing out the, the four major activities that are allowed currently. And that includes activities uh, for health and safety for yourself, your family and pets. Obtaining necessary supplies for the family and the household, that includes obviously uh, food and cleaning supplies and things like that. There's also uh, still allowed for us to do some exercising outdoors, maintaining the six foot social distance. It's very, very important to take that into consideration. If you're gonna go out and ride a bike or walk, 
uh, you know, in the trails or on the street, it's very important to still obey and follow the, the social distance, distancing rules. Uh, also, when it, also one of the activities that is allowed, again, is to work if you are part of, if you're an employee of a VEXAM business, you still need to follow the social distancing recommendations and uh, rules. There are some things that are not allowed. For instance, uh, if you are sick, you're not allowed to leave home. Why? Not only to protect yourself, yourself but also to protect others. Uh, uh, also, we're not allowed to do things that are not considered essential, so, such as uh, uh, going to the hair salon and the barber shop and uh, visiting friends and gathering outside your home. That is not allowed because, you know, it does it prevent us to maintain the social distancing. And uh, so, again, outdoor activities can be done uh, even in small groups, but the, the six foot distance is very uh, is required to be to be followed. Uh, when it comes to the nursing homes, and as everybody knows, the nursing homes are facilities that have our elderly and sick people, people that need a lot of attention, and most of them, or the big majority of them, have uh, related health conditions. So right now you know, uh, the nursing homes are, are prohibited to allow people to come from the outside for visiting unless they are providing medical assistance or uh, uh, in some instances visiting somebody, uh, a friend or, or a family member that is, you know, in a terminal stage or is expected, expected to pass away soon. When it comes to enforcement uh, of the orders, you know, obviously we are encouraging everybody to comply on their own. And, uh, a, a, and we utilize the law enforcement, you know, to enforce that and some officers dedicate uh, some of their efforts to, to do that. But we expect voluntary compliance. And the, the officers that are trying to uh, educate in um, the community you know, have some flexibility. Uh, so far, uh, we have had some reports uh, uh, that people are not following the social distance and stay home rules. So the officers, again, are being flexible, trying to reeducate everybody and tell them how, how important it is. And sometimes they issue warnings. Uh, they have not put a lot of, you know, uh, a strict, you know, behavior, you know, um, and they are not necessarily um, doing fines and all that because again uh, they are trying to encourage people to um, have uh, uh, to follow the rules but if this continues these uh, uh, rules can be you know applied more strictly now it's important for people to know about testing and it's, uh, I want to mention that the, the the protocol for testing, has been changing over time as a result of the situation. So this is more or less what the current uh, uh, process is. Again, this is still uh, not recommended for everyone to get tested. And there is a couple of reasons for that. One of them is the availability of sufficient tests. So basically the, uh, the, uh, the healthcare system, it's utilizing the test uh, available to uh, be able to assess the, the individuals that are uh, symptomatic, you know. Uh, so that's what is recommended for people that have mild symptoms to stay home, isolate, isolate themselves, and uh, not to overwhelm the healthcare system. And uh, obviously, if you are sick, you stay home and you just separate yourself from, from the rest of the family, and that's what we call it home isolation. Now, if people have severe symptoms, just like uh, the ones that I mentioned before, which includes fever, cough, and shortness of breath, it is important to call the doctor or the urgent, urgent care clinic or the emergency, emergency department before going. This is very important for them to kind of do a pre-assessment and determine if it is imperative that you and see that uh, because they screening now during the flu season 
happen. The similar to flu. That's why the provider needs to assess as can make based on that. The MedHealth has a screening tool. Anybody can use and it can be found on the website and uh, it, you'll find and it's easy to go through that and determine if you're going to need to a professional or to uh, test it. It's still the test is uh, by appointment only, you know, and uh, it is being uh, emphasized under a health report and again in the bad has symptoms. Yes. Car yes. Carlos, Carlos, excuse me. I, I need to interrupt for a second. Um we're we're losing your video and um and and we're having a little bit of problems with your audio. Um and so um we can see the slides on the screen pretty well. Um but um it it's a little frustrating to um, your audio is uh, uh, lagging for people right now. Um, there were a whole bunch of questions that came in to the queue, um, and um, I'm wondering if, um, Carlos, you can um, stay in the chat um, uh, and answer some of those questions in the chat. Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm, the problem is... Uh, uh, that we're having difficulty hearing you. So it's it's a little frustrating for people listening. Um, Sophia, can can you Absolutely. perhaps pull up some yes, of the Carlos, so we have a and those two. Yes. Carlos, can we still hear your yeah, audio? I can I can I can hear you uh, uh, do you want me to stop the sharing or do you want me to uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close I'm gonna close your screen your mm -hmm. your slides and let's see if that makes it your audio okay. better and um go ahead and sophia ask sure. a couple of the questions and then we're gonna have to we're gonna have to skedaddle so i can get to the All next right, session Carlos, we have a, a little under 10 minutes okay. to address some of the questions that came through and of course carlos we thank you for all the the knowledge that you're sharing one of the questions that we have is is there a fee or a charge for testing it depends where you go, because if, if you go to urgent care, uh, urgent care clinic, you may be charged for that. Uh, there's other organizations that are doing it, uh, you know, based on their own sliding scale fee. Uh, and I'm thinking also about, for instance, uh, the care clinic, my understanding, uh, Central Med is doing it for free now. If anybody do not have a, uh, a way to pay for for the testing, uh, they can call the hotline uh, uh, at Metro Health, uh, which is 210-207-5779. Then uh, the the staff will, will uh, inform the the process and the test if it's done in the area where Metro Health is doing it. Uh, then the, there's no charge for the testing. Wonderful. And that phone number is 210-207-5779, correct? That is correct. And it, it can be found also in Metro Health website. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's see. So another question, and I think you t did touch on this. Uh, is Metro Health allowing testing for anyone who wants it, or is the testing limited? I know that you mentioned that um, it's not being encouraged if there's no symptomology. Can you uh, say a bit more on that as far as um, what Metro Health is allowing? That is correct. Uh, the The testing is being done right now only for people that have symptoms. So if anybody has a doubt if they could uh, be eligible or it would be good for them to take the test, it's important that they call the hotline and they can also call the 311 if that's easier for them and get connected to the hotline and they will provide directives uh, and determine if they really need a test. But if they uh, meet the criteria or being symptomatic, they will be tested and they will not. Right now, there is not a requirement. Uh, in the past, it was, but right now, there is no requirement for them to have to be uh, referred by a physician. So depending on the symptoms that they present, you know, they can be uh, directed to take the test, uh, and again, it will be free of charge. But it's not it's not being done right now for people to, that do not have symptoms. 
Understood. Okay. Um, one last question I'm looking at here is, is it recommended that nursing home residents where staff have tested positive, um, should those folks be tested even if they're asymptomatic? Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yes, my understanding is that the directives that uh, was provided by uh, the, the city and the county yesterday is that uh, all the individuals uh, that are in the um, uh, nursing homes and, and on those facilities are being closely monitored, particularly with what happened the one on the on the east side, and in, uh, in, in which they have an outbreak, uh, they are you know testing uh, everybody to make sure that they they are uh, okay. Again, those that's a particular and a very high risk population. They, they are doing testing uh, to uh, uh, all those individuals in the nursing home. Understood. And so, Carlos, I'm so sorry, the, the presentation itself lost connection. Do you have any final thoughts? We have about four minutes left. Do you have any final thoughts on um, on COVID and, and what you're wanting to present today? Yes, uh, uh, I wanted just to uh, make you aware that uh, obviously we have heard about a, a lot of uh, immigrant population, uh, whether it is documented or undocumented that are being afraid, particularly with the with the public charge rules. We wanted to clarify that uh, even immigration, uh, federal immigration services have clarified that all medical care in regards to COVID-19 will not affect uh, uh, their cases. So uh, uh, also the immigrants uh, can seek medical attention in the federal qualified healthcare facilities or at Metro Health and they will not affect their their situation. And the last one is a thing when it comes to um, a, the community health workers and social workers in our community, that right now the city uh, is trying to utilize some of that capacity to assist the city in informing certain areas that do not get a lot of uh, information. A lot of us have access to internet, you know, and uh, uh, cell phones and messaging and all that, but there is an important section uh, of our community, particularly in certain zip codes that we have identified that need uh, uh, more information. And yes, actually today, we're gonna start targeting some of those zip codes and uh, taking health equity into consideration, you know, uh, to reach out to that population so uh, I want to formally invite uh, all the community health workers, social workers in our community, they want to join their effort to get in contact with me and I can connect them with the um, a emergency operations center that is coordinated that effort. We have to continue, we have to continue pushing for uh, social distancing and prevention particularly in in the in those communities where we have again people that do not necessarily have access to the same level of information or dated information and accurate and uh, information uh, and uh, we, we need those uh, uh, we need help and if anybody in this uh, summit you know is interested uh, uh, you know let us know we will we will be more than glad to to have you guys join us. And, uh, and I will appreciate if that's possible. And obviously I think it will be uh, a very, very important, maybe easier to do it through a health collaborative, you know, to facilitate that in case there's some people that, I mean, I know that some people are already doing it, but if they if they wanna join uh, the, the uh, emergency operations center that is uh, uh, managing the COVID situation in San Antonio, let us know and uh, uh, your help is needed in some of those communities and due to your experience working with uh, uh, low-income communities, communities of color, I think it, it, it will be very, very effective. Uh, we're still going to need to go out and, and work with those individuals and those people. So it's, a, it's an open invitation and again, uh, if we can facilitate that, facilitate that through our work with the Health Collaborative, that will be that will be wonderful. So, that is great, uh, that, Carlos. Thank you so much for that. And I'm just going to get your email real quick. Is that an appropriate way to connect with you regarding this? Definitely. Uh, uh, Charlotte and Jordan also have my email address, and mm -hmm. uh, and I can facilitate the connection again with the Emergency Operations Center and logistics that are managing uh, all these efforts with the community health workers right now. 
That's great. Okay, so I'll let the audience know that we'll be sharing that email with you guys um, once the summit is completed. And Carlos, thank you so much for your time and your efforts here with the summit. And for you participants, uh, to get to the next session, you'll click on the schedule uh, link on the top left of your screen, and you'll go ahead and select your next destination. However, you, however, <laughs> just a quick note, the uh, uh, immigration session will be starting a little bit late since I have to go set it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte.